Howdy. All right, let me get this started. I saw a timer on there, and I can watch that time, too. There we go. All right. So I am Chris Greer. Uh, I'm Vice President of Sales for Ridge Global Buildings. I manage Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, half of Florida, Minnesota, Michigan, North Dakota, and Wisconsin, and Kentucky, and Tennessee. Those are my states. We have a Denver office that handles the rest of the states, but for this core group, no matter what state you're in, you call me, because we handle those in a special uh, category for the Flex guys. Uh, probably on every single uh, one of these uh, lunch and learns I do or presentations that I do, uh, also every developer that walks in my office, uh, they always seem to ask the same question. When do I need to buy the building? Uh, well, that's a two-part answer. The easy answer is three months. It takes eight to 12 weeks. If you haven't done it before, we can do it in eight weeks. We can sometimes do it in seven or six weeks. But three months is about right from order to delivery. Now, that's the short answer. Uh, now we're going to go through the long one. Chris, ones. are you going to give us a copy of this presentation or should we take a couple pictures? Yes. Uh, when we get to the end, there's a QR code. Y'all can shoot it with your phone. You can put this entire presentation on your phone. It'll have links to my phone, my email, our website, everything you might need. What is your phone number? Just real fast, Chris. Put it here. Say again? What's your phone number? Uh, it's on here. Okay. And for all of us dinosaurs, because I, I had this... Uh, <laughs> I had this idea, I said, man, I'm gonna take this to Kinko's and print it out and give it out to everybody. And our marketing guy said, well, why don't we do a QR code and make it all digital and they can carry it with them on their phone wherever they go. I'm a dinosaur, sorry. All right, so the first thing we wanna talk about is when you're building with steel, you have two different kinds of ways to build. You've got the pre-engineered building, that's what we do, which is a bolt up uh, building. The other is a structural building. On the bolt up, rigid will design, engineer, detail, manufacture all the parts. We seal the project with an engineer seal. We have seals for all 50 states. Uh, everything is ours. If you say, hey, I wanna make this a little bit taller, a little bit wider, can you give me a little different clearance? We can make any and all adjustments that you wanna make. A structural building would be where you go to some other engineer and he designs your building. Now, if he designs it, you bring it back to me, and a lot of times we just sell you the parts. So in that case, we're not designing, we're not doing any kind of engineering, we're just cutting up parts that some other engineer said to cut up. Now, in most of those cases, the other engineer is designing a weld up. So you're gonna take, the general theme is they have steel columns going around the perimeter with a steel beam around the perimeter there, and then joists that sit on top of those beams for your ceiling underneath and for your roof on top. That's your basic structural uh, building. It lends itself well to a building that goes in and out, has a lot of features. Our building lends itself better to more of a boxy building, something that's a square or rectangle. We can get more complicated, but sometimes a structural is the better choice. If you're building a Dairy Queen, structural is probably the better choice. When you get into a warehouse where you want big spans, then we're the better choice. Structural, you might get 50 foot clear span out of a bar joist. We can give you 400 foot clear span with a rigid frame. The final project looks the same. If you have a structural or a pre-engineered building, it looks exactly the same from the outside. The only difference is what the guts of the building look like. And in our case, we're gonna make all these parts in our shop Everything's cut, welded, the holes punch, and it's ready to just be bolted together on the job site. And the erector bolts everything together, and all it has to do is cut the panel trims on the rake and uh, the, the gutters and things. They have to marry those together. So what makes the PEB better? They call it PEB, PEMB, pre-engineered building, pre-engineered metal building. Uh, sometimes you pe hear people say steel building, metal building. It's all the same thing. Uh, usually our weight is lighter. Now that's one of the things that the other engineer would say, you come in and say, hey, I wanna add a thousand pound RTU on the roof because I've got a new tenant. And your other engineer says, yeah, that's fine, go ahead. I I've got an extra 100,000 pounds up there. And, and I say, well, we didn't design for a thousand pounds. If you wanna add a thousand pounds, 
We're going to have to come up with a design to make that work. We can add all the extra capacity on the front side too. If you say, I want a mechanical zone all the way down my roof and I can put RTUs in every position, no problem. But again, the idea is to get in cheaper, not spend a bunch of money on extra capacity you don't need. And when y'all talk about triple net, somebody comes in, they want to put an RTU on the roof, hey, let them pay the three or $4,000 it takes to add the steel and get that thing fortified. So ours is usually lighter. When you look at a structural set of plans, most of the members are 30, 40, up to 100 pounds of foot. Metal building, more like 20, 25 pounds of foot. Uh, the engineering's a lot less. If you go to a structural engineer, they'll charge you 30 grand for a set of drawings. Uh, ours were about 3,500, so we really beat them up bad on that. No welding on site uh, and no weld inspections because we do all the welding in-house and we have third-party weld inspectors that check all of our welds with infrared. If it's a commercial building, it's 20% check. If it's a government or school or a church, it gets 100% weld check and our welders don't know which building's which. They have to weld as if everything's 100%. So what are the limits of my pre-engineered building? Well, you could do 300 foot clear span. We had a 375 over in uh, San Antonio Airport. 200 mile an hour wind load. That'd be out Caribbean islands, something like that, facing the ocean. 100 foot tall, unlimited length, 200 ton cranes, all styles of construction. You can do a standard metal building where you have metal panels around. I can also build you a frame with a roof and a beam so you can add studs to your wall and not have a big clunky metal building wall when you're in a retail situation where you've got limited space and you don't want a big thick wall taking up your floor space. So that's a different style. We talk about that a little in a bit. TPO, y'all probably know TPO roofs is like a rubberized roof. Uh, we can design the, all the support and decking you need for those kind. Uh, if you're in Texas, we have the Texas Department of Insurance which manages the windstorm uh, deal, and we can design to any windstorm from Pearland to Galveston, uh, and we can design anywhere in the United States. Is that hurricane-proof, uh, floor-level hurricane? Are yeah. Are going to be okay in Florida? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and that's the thing. If a hurricane hits your building dead on, there's probably nothing that it's gonna, that's going to stop it. Uh, but, yeah, if it's, we can design to Florida codes, we're... We have all the certifications for the most stringent counties in the United States. So for wind, it's Miami-Dade, and we have that certification. For seismic, it's Clark County up in Nevada. We have that. City of LA, City of Houston, those are hard to get. We've got all those certifications. My last one was Pyramid with a Roller Coaster because uh, we had uh, Astroworld here in town, and it was like a Six Flags, and they needed someone to build a pyramid that they could clad with stucco and ephus and make it look like it was the Mayan mind bender. So we built a bolt up pyramid for their roller coaster. We, there's not much we can't do. So before you start planning, this is called step by step flex. So we're gonna go one through six, I believe. But before we even get to step one, Start making a photo file. Everything you see on the street that you like, you see that canopy. To me, this is just beautiful. I love the way the setup is if you're doing retail. And you might be able to say, man, I really want a canopy like this, or I want the roof to extend over like that. Take pictures of anything you see that you like, because it'll be a lot easier for you to explain it to me. We could talk about potential problems. Like, for instance, that roof would be a nightmare. Uh, you, those valleys are horrible for metal roofs. They're, you know, it's just, it's not made for that kind of situation. It can be, and I'm gonna show you all some buildings here in a little bit that have cut up roofs, but that costs money and that has maintenance, a lot of callbacks. Really, we're just about the structural support. So you say, hey, I'm going to have a 200-pound sign right here, then we'll add a piece of steel at that point uh, to support that sign. And then your electrician knows how to move through our stuff. And, and our members are generally 8, 10, and 12-inch, so your roof cavity and your wall cavities are going to be 8, 10, and 12-inch. There's a lot of room for mechanical in them. 
So step one, what can you build? What will the county or the city allow you to build? So this is back to your concept. And I'm, I'm thinking at this point, you've got some land in mind. You're picked out the land because you've got to run through this to see if it's going to work, right? So you find your land. What will they let you build? Some things can't be built in certain areas. Uh, what did we say, Manville last time? They said it's a 5,000 square foot limit, and at 5,001, you've got to put a wet sprinkler system in the building. It cost you fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. A bigger building, even more. So what are they going to allow you to build? If you go to Sugar Land, where we're at, it's like over on that 90 corridor. It's called the... Uh, uh, greater Sugar Land District or something, anything that faces the road has to have masonry. You know, there's a lot of difference in price between metal building walls and brick walls. So if you want to know what are they going to let you build so you can figure out what it's going to cost. Special finishes, special fire codes, uh, how will the shape of the lot affect your building? Not a big deal for us. You need skewed buildings or whatever, we can do all that. Uh, but Certainly in a retail situation, you generally see 60, 70 foot wide. They need to have a little back room back there to do their thing, and they need enough room for a store in the front. Office warehouse, they usually want 50, 60 foot spans. They want enough room to get their uh, 12 foot P vans in there to unload materials. So we need to know how the shape of the lot how are you going to get in and out of your lot and in and out of your building? That's going to have a lot to do with the size of the building. One of my favorite projects has buildings that run down both ends like this, and he has a center esplanade and then parking, double parking on both sides. And it looks like, man, most of the parking lot's gobbled up, or most of the lot is gobbled by parking. But almost everybody that goes over there says, man, I love the parking setup. They love it because with the way they can get in and do their thing and operate their businesses, it works well. Okay, step two. How many buildings can you fit on the property? This is where you're going to engage a civil engineer. You probably you have some concept idea that, uh, you know, again, when I said the three months earlier, there's also a first step that you got to call me on the front side and we'll tell you how much the buildings are going to cost. You say, this is what I'm thinking about building. I'll say, yeah, put 15 bucks a foot or 20 bucks a foot or whatever. You can start doing your budgeting. And then you find land and you do all of your, everything that, uh, that he did before to find out it's a good investment. Then you're going to see a civil engineer. He's going to determine where's the parking lot, where's the entrance. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of challenges for the civil engineer to decide where do the buildings fit on the lot. Uh, here in Texas, we have detention. I'm sure most other states have that. Uh, it's just detaining your storm water for a while uh, and so that it can drain out slowly into the, sewer, into the storm sewer system. Uh, DOT entrances, you might find if you buy a lot and your next door neighbor has an entrance right there at the edge of your lot, you're not going to be putting an entrance right there on that corner. The, the Department of Transportation wants to push it out. They want some distance between those entrances. So you got to think about those as you're laying out your civil. Uh, the fire code, the parking lot, easements, all of those things you're going to have to deal with. So step three, now we're getting into the building. What type of building style fits your area? Uh, that's pretty crazy on the top, but it's a good looking building. Uh, that thing on the bottom is pretty spartan. Uh, you need to decide, based on the area you're in, if they've got these kind of buildings everywhere, don't build that, and vice versa, because you don't want to spend the big bucks in an area that you can't get it back out of the, uh, out of the deal. What's hot in the area? I, my best developers are going to the areas where there's big residential developments that are popping up, and they're, they're out from the city a little bit, and they know they're going to get served with all these small business people that live in these big neighborhoods, big expensive houses. They want a little office warehouse. They have their secretary in a room. They got their warehouse, their AC business, their tax accounting business, whatever it is. You got to figure out what's hot in your area, what looks good in your area. Don't build a dump in the middle of the Taj Mahal. Uh, and who are your tenants? You know, when you get into your tenants, industrial buildings are going to be real simple. You know, they're going to be a box, 
and maybe you put a little facade on the front. You put some stone on the bottom, you put some glass, you put a canopy over the door. There's not much more to it. When you get to retail, it's going to be different. They're going to want a lot of glass in the front, room for all their signage. Uh, retail might need RTUs on the roof. You might be thinking more. On a warehouse, nobody puts support on the roof. But on retail, everybody does. Uh, what kind of access do they need for delivery trucks? Are they using P vans where they just need a 12-foot door? Or are they using 18-wheelers where you need a 14-foot door? Step four, what structural features are available? So now we've picked our land. We have our vision of what we want to build. Uh, you've run the numbers. It all makes sense. You found out what the county lets you build. You've got this piece of land. It's all cut up. And now, what can you do with those buildings? What are your limitations? Uh, our claim to fame is clear span frames. We were talking about this earlier, that we could do 300, 400 foot clear spans, no problem. Uh, they're expensive, though. So if you've, got a, if you've got a warehouse that they're building file cabinets, uh, columns are probably fine every 50 feet. They're building helicopters, might not be as good. So in, some, in a lot of cases, we do clear span and flex space because, think about this, if this is a gable building, so it's got two slope roofs going like this, the uh, span of 50, 60, 70 feet, whatever it is, and then our base spacing is every 20 or 30 feet, that gives you a wide open center section that you can separate however you want. If you've got tenant, 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 and then these guys leave, and this guy says, I want all three, but I need a big giant warehouse. You don't need those columns blocking up your warehouse. Also, don't forget that in our system, until you get to about 70, 80, 90 feet, a column's just adding weight. So when we do a span of 70 feet and you put a column there, you're just adding weight. We don't need that column. So I'm going to say your, your, your typical is 40 to 70 for flex space because they're going to have that depth, and then the length is usually divided by the max you can do for fire code without putting in a wet sprinkler. And, and then that depth a lot of times is designed by lots. You know, lots are always skinny and long, so then you're shifting it over to one side and then trying to create an access point on the other side. So we see a lot of 40, 50, 60, 70, uh, when you start getting beyond that, they get into big warehouses, you know, 100 by 100, 100 by 200, 100 by 300. It just, it usually isn't flex space when it gets that big. It's single tenant and big tenants. Uh, in some cases, if you wanted the building to be 100 feet, you can put columns at every mainframe. Uh, it saves you money at 100 feet. Maybe you're talking about 10%. Uh, as you get into snow country, all these numbers shift a little bit. Everything's a little heavier in snow country. What about the what? It says snow or mezzanine. Yeah, mezzanine. So think about your building has a 20-pound live load on the, on the roof, but a mezzanine is a 125-pound live load. It's a lot of extra steel, and it's a lot of extra support, so you can't get really big – well, I shouldn't say that. The, the typical span for mezzanine is 20 to 30 feet. That's on a grid pattern. Uh, and if you wanted to, let's say, let's say this is 100 by 500, and you want a mezzanine across here, maybe what I'll do is every 30 feet, I'll put a big girder beam so that I could get my 20 feet and put my joist in here. But that big girder beam, typically the span of the girder in feet is equal to the number of inches in height. Just that's a good rule of thumb. So if I'm spanning 50 feet, I've got a 50 inch tall girder. And y'all see this when you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or Walmart, just look up. You'll see the big giant joist going across the, the, the girder and then you'll see the smaller joist going the other way. So with mezzanines, you either use columns or you have a big joist girder. Uh, open for studs. We, I brought this up a minute ago. There are different ways to do this, but typically uh, we're providing some sort of a spandrel beam at the top, and then you'll put 
your studs in, however you want to do it. You could set up all your own framed openings. This is another one of those neat ways. I, I'm doing a, another presentation later on flexible flex and how to do things so that if your tenants change and you want to change your facade, it would be easy to do it. That's a good way. Uh, this allows for uh, odd finishes. If right now, you know, metal building panels uh, are usually on five-foot centers. So we have five-foot supports, and then you have the panels that go onto that. The, uh, the metal studs allow you to use hardy plank or old uh, timber, something that the, a designer would come up with that you're not going to put it on five-foot spacing. It's going to need some kind of a grid behind it. 